on air. There we go. Hey guys, I hope this is working. Let's. I hope so too. Hi everyone. <laughs> Thank you guys. I don't know why I look down, 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 as if I'd see people more that way. I know. Um, I'm hoping. I'm trying to see if it's working because I literally have no idea. If someone knows if it's working, will you tweet me? Because I'm. I'm not totally sure. Because it still says "please stand by" on my on my Google on my my YouTube. Your YouTube. Let me see. But maybe did you hit refresh? Yeah. Does it does it like die if we're both in the hangout? <laughs> I don't think so. I don't I don't believe so. Hey, someone tweet me if this is working, okay? No, no one is tweeting me. I like that, um, all right, hold on, let me try this again. I'm going to end it and start it again. Wait, 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 don't working. do anything. It's I live. literally have no idea. Oh, it's, live. it's working. Will you tweet me? Because uh, I'm okay. I love that the first. Air. There we go. Sure. Hey, guys. It's a delay. There's okay. a delay. I love that the first few minutes is going to be just me and you going, is it working? I don't know. It's a delay. It's a delay. I got it. <laughs> okay, good. Hey Vera, how are you? Oh, see, now people are telling me that it's working. Yay! Hi everyone. That's super nice. Um, hey Vera, how are you? Good. Hey Bria, how are you? <laughs> I'm glad we wore our hair the same. Are you? Is your hair in pigtails? No, it's just it's in a side pony. Oh, it's in a side pony. Oh. Mostly because it's a total mess right now. Yeah, mine is too. That's why it's back. I just got a little bit more of my scratchy. Sex, vo sex phone voice back. <clears throat> okay, that's good. Well, when I talked to you the other day, you always sounded like you had, you, you didn't have a voice. You were like, you've had that weird. Yeah. Yeah. I had some, I had some, it went past sexy phone voice to some other not so good thing, like dead. <laughs> oh, well, I'm glad, I, I'm glad you were back. Thank you. <clears throat> um, Hey, are you excited about um, our our movie <laughs> being on on? on um, oh, I'm trying to watch it now. See if people are commenting and stuff. Who's commenting? Um, what are you guys I, saying? I want to know everything. I, I know. So you guys can tweet. hang out with us. <laughs> you can tweet um, to me at, at Bria Grant, or you can um, go sign into YouTube. And um, I believe if you sign into YouTube, you can write stuff on there. But I'm not totally sure how that works, so you may have to tweet me. Yeah, I want to It's like, it's working. <laughs> I feel like it's like I'm so surprised by technology right now. If um, you're surprised by technology, then I am completely befuddled. Um, sorry, I'm just sorry. My mom is texting me, so I'm just going to ask her if, if, she can, if she can see if she can chat. Um, Hey, so our movie is on is on new and noteworthy on iTunes. I know we're right next to Marina Abramovich's "The Artist Is Present," which I think I, is pretty cool. I have no idea what that is. Oh, really? You should watch it. Marina Abramovich is um, this incredible performance artist, and she did this um, piece at the at um, MoMA in New York, where she sat all day in a chair. Uh, I mean, there were other pieces as well. There were live pieces with live people and positions essentially being works of art. And she was one of them. And she just sat there. And you could come and you could sit down across the table from her and just look at her. And she wouldn't speak. Um, she would just stare at you. And um, it was just like what this huge sensation. Uh, the, the exhibit was called The Artist is Present. And it was this incredible physical feat because she didn't go to the bathroom. She didn't eat. She didn't drink. All day. That sounds horrible. I know. I know. But the doc. I she's never watched it either. Maybe it's it amazing, and the documentary's incredible. Yeah, it's good. Um, so we're up there on new and noteworthy, um, yeah. independent, which is crazy mm -hmm. and amazing. Um, mm -hmm. and also, I don't know if people know this, but like, you can't pay to be up there. You can't. Um. I mean, I think if you know someone on the inside, maybe you can get up there, but we didn't. So we actually, like, had to sell enough to be up mm -hmm. there, which was kind of exciting. 
Yeah, especially since we're such a small film and we didn't have the marketing budget and like the, the A-list celebrity names or like the backing of some huge studio or even a small studio. It was all DIY. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And um, yeah, and I think, I, yeah, and we basically like through social media were like, hey, buy this movie and people actually bought it. <laughs> Thanks everyone for buying the movie. <laughs> Um, I'm I'm telling people via Twitter to come join if you want to. So people are asking questions. Um, okay. I can't for some reason I cannot post this via Twitter. Let's come on. Um. So someone wants to know. Jake M. Larson wants to know what did you do with the sweet red hoodie from the movie? Did you frame it or put it somewhere special? Vera, do you know where that is right now? Do you, oh I have it. No. I don't know where it was because I know where it is. You you know where it is. Is yeah. it in, is it in a biohazard pile? <laughs> it should be. The yeah. was, and the funny thing about the hoodie is that normally on a set, okay, the, the hoodie <laughs> is in my garage. I think. I think it's in my garage in a box. Um, but the normally in a set you have several versions of something, right? Because mm -hmm. that's you know the best way to um to not have stink every day is to have lots of versions, especially because you can't wash it every day or whatever. But that hoodie was the only hoodie we had, so I wore that hoodie for 20-some-odd days straight. Yep. Gross, yep. nasty. And then I got a stain on it, like, right here the first day, and it's on a drug the entire movie. Which I is never cool. saw that stain. I, I notice it a lot. But um, because we weren't supposed to wear long sleeve shirts, I didn't actually have a hoodie, and that was, like, a last-minute hoodie choice, which was super random. Well, for those of you who are watching, a un small unknown fact is that I'm not actually wearing pants in the film. <laughs> I'm wearing two layers of tights, which are technically not pants, um, because Bria and I were going to originally shoot the film in June. Yeah. And like many films, our timeline was delayed, but we didn't necessarily adapt to that, did we, Bria? We stuck with the wardrobe choices of June for November. <laughs> we did. We did. I'm not totally sure why we decided to do that. Um, but we totally did. Um, so someone wants to know if you're not on Twitter anymore, because someone just asked that. You want to talk about that? Oh, guys, it's so stupid. I, I was on Twitter, yes, and then I maybe had a breakup. And I maybe felt like I was getting too much information with too little action. My, my groceries are here, so you're going to have to talk for a second. Just keep going. Basically, it's not that interesting, but I had a breakup, and um, I found that I was getting too much information through all these different social networking things that wasn't actually telling me anything. And so in a rash move, I deleted my Twitter account. I'm kind of regretting it now, um, and maybe I'll go back, but then the idea of trying to, like, get everything back, I, eh, eh, I'm over the breakup, so um, uh, I'm, at least I'm over the part where I, I, I'm afraid of social networking. So maybe you guys will see me on Twitter again. Um, Bria's getting her groceries right now, which <laughs> means that I have to... You're supposed to be here before 7, which is why I was like, I can do this at 7, no big deal. It shouldn't be a problem. As you can see, Bria and I are both in our respective homes. <laughs> it's true. We, for some reason, did not decide to, uh, to, to meet up. Okay, someone wants to know, someone by the name of Houseboat Mom, who I know who that is, wants to know, <laughs> was, was the tortoise shot planned? Bria? Oh, that's me. Um... Uh, the first shot, so randomly, so there's a tortoise in the movie, and it has, we have this beautiful shot of it walking across the grass, and it's totally adorable. Um, and it was not planned, because we, on our reshoots, we had a lovely girl by the name of Jazz Moore, who brought her, her tortoise to set, and we put the tortoise in the movie, and it ended up being such a beautiful shot, and I'm so glad we did it. But that tortoise had to stay on set for like 12 hours that day, and it was very, very well behaved. If you, isn't it? And if you think about it, it's the only shot in the film with like with an, an animal, right? I guess that's yeah. right. You yeah. know, because those who are watching should know that we we tried really hard over and over again to get Bria's dog into our film. We really did. Hattie was on the schedule. I mean, a lot. She was on it like a few times, and then 
poor thing. She, her scenes kept getting cut. I know. I know. My poor dog. Okay, we have more questions. Okay. Um, how did we decide on the pacer car? Um, God, do you want to talk about that? Okay, like well, the decision was essentially made for us. The more pacer? So. Yeah, the pacer was, was basically what it ended up happening. We definitely knew that we wanted a vintage car. Um, and we had actually bought what I think, if I remember correctly, was a 1964 Toyota Mark III station wagon. I, might, I, don't, I think that's the right name for it. It's actually a really unusual car. It was beautiful. It was this turquoise, huge station wagon, so unusual, you know. And everyone's like, this is Harriet's car. And then it died. Yeah. And it, it totally no died. matter how much repair the mechanics tried to put on it, it wouldn't come back. And so our um, one of our producers, Stacy Story, um, pulled a rabbit out of her hat and ended up getting a picture car for us for the film. And that picture car was the 76 AMC Pacer, which is really totally unique looking and everyone really responds to it but for Bria and our cinematographer to go from a huge station wagon with a ton of windows and a lot of room for the cinematographer, a huge camera, a camera operator, a sound person to go from a station That's wagon to a tiny little hatchback yeah, it's horrible. It was horrible. It was. You know, when you hear something crazy, I, um, I just got done shooting this movie called Smothered and it was directed by John Schneider and in Louisiana, and I went over to where John Schneider was staying, and he bought a car for his next movie, and believe it or not, no, it was a fucking no. <laughs> it was, no, it was not. Trailer. I almost said it was the same car, but it was um, it's a station wagon in the same color, though, and I started wondering if that was like a popular color of that pacer. Somebody, if you know the answer to that, I have no idea. Um... Anyway, I didn't even know they made one. pacers into station wagons. They did. They do. And I'm sure they're just as unreliable. Okay. Um, the wardrobe looked very post-apocalyptic. Mad Max, stockings with holes, boots, etc. Was that done on purpose? Yeah. So um, if you watch the movie, there's a part where we, um, you know, think the, our two characters, for those who haven't seen the movie, are kind of stuck in the middle of nowhere and trying to figure out, like, oh, man, what happened? And what they don't know is that... Um, there's actually been a nuclear bomb blast and all these crazy things have happened, um, but they just know that someone car, uh, you know, carjacked them, and then also they met this like racist crazy dude and who tried to kill them, and so they were just like trying to figure out, um, you know, what is going on. So they're like, you know, what people do in the movies, they get dressed like badasses, and so that's why the characters put on these crazy outfits or what they consider crazy outfits or rip their clothes off or whatever because they're in the middle of nowhere and they're goofy and um, yes yeah, it's just totally on purpose super fun I, that was one of my favorite scenes in the movie it is one of the scenes in the movie that was cut that way and never really changed so we started we edited it the way it is the first edit is the way it is in the movie which is sort of sort of interesting tidbit that that would be good those are good extras that yeah. footage yeah that's <laughs> <laughs> I'm very at that footage because there's one shot of my of my boobs popping. Yeah, the boob shot. Um, more questions are: You can order groceries there. Yes, I can. We order them from Amazon Fresh because Kevin and I are having a party tomorrow. <laughs> um, how long did it take you from? I'm sorry, I should read people's names, huh? Um, yes, 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 yes. Because I want to know who they are too. Jack Marchetti, butchering that, I'm sure. How long did it take you guys to write the script? How many drafts did you do, and how much rewriting took place while, while filming? Ooh, these are good questions. Oh, so what oh. do you think? Well, um, those of you may or may not know that Bria and I actually started a horror script first. Um, and that was, we got about 60 to 70 pages into that one, so that took up a little bit of time. And then we ended up dropping that script and picking this one up. So what do you think? It was a year. I think I think it was yeah. I think it was a year. a year in all the interviews. I don't know if that's right, but about a year of writing and rewriting and dropping the other one and getting. I know you tell everyone that it took us two years to make the movie, but it took us two years to make it, but a year to write it. Actually, I know. Well, I, tell, I today someone asked how long, and I was like, I like to say two years. Vera says three. <laughs> I like it to be less time than I. <laughs> of your life. 
of my life that I, that I put into this movie. You're trying, you're trying to get back that year? Three is way too long. Three is so long that it's horrifying. Um, yeah, so three. Um, it took us, and then we didn't do hardly any rewriting on set. We actually stuck to the script on, like, a lot of movies. But then we went back and reshot the ending. So we actually rewrote a lot of the movie after it had already been shot. Yeah, so we did a lot, a lot, a lot of a lot of versions of it. Actually, if I were to go back into my computer, I would see version blah 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 blah. We we rewrote a lot. We did readings, and we did have to rewrite the scene that we were just talking about with the apocalypse, like the cutting of the furniture of the clothing, because we lost the location. So we had to essentially adapt on set for that part. And then after we shot in Texas, yeah, like Bria said, like what we we spent a we spent a good amount of time rewriting the beginning and the end before our reshoots. I think that we actually devoted a good bit of time to those rewrites. Yeah, um, I mean, I edited. I know in between shoots and reshoots was about six months because I edited. That includes editing and and doing work on it. Yeah. Um. Um. Okay. Um, Mo V wants to know red hoodie equals little red riding hood. Mo V, I love your obsession with this red hoodie because everyone <laughs> seems to have it. The funny thing about that hoodie is that because we were shooting, we didn't know it was going to be cold and that hoodie was just supposed to be in the last scene of the movie and I was going to throw it on at the end. So it ended up being very random um, that it was there for the entire time. Um, and I think my costume designer did have some ideas of Little Red Riding Hood and things along those lines, but you'd have to ask him. He's an amazing costume designer. You should look him up for your movie if you want to do a movie. So people, you guys can post on Twitter or on um, YouTube. I'm going back and forth. So on Twitter, um, Lucky Bamboo wants to know, will this be available on Blu-ray or DVD? Vera, you want to address that? We're trying our hardest to have the film available on DVD. Um, uh, you know, it's, we're sort of in the midst of negotiating um, a deal and I'm not sure if it's going to happen, honestly. So we have to get back to you on that. I think it's going to happen. Don't be so negative about that. I'm trying to be being realistic, you know, like, I don't want to overpromise, essentially. Um, I think it will be la available later on DVD, hopefully, and regardless, Vera and I have to make DVDs because we have to give them to our Kickstarter backers. Yeah, so regardless, like I mean, extra for we're people. hoping that we're going to have a, a DVD deal, DVD deal where there's actually a professionally created DVD. <laughs> Right, you know, um, that then becomes something that's available to a wider group of people than our Kickstarter donors. Yeah. Um, so regardless, yes, we're going to make a DVD for our Kickstarter folks, for sure. Super funny, though, because people have been reaching out to me on Twitter and asking if we're going to be, um, if we're going to um, have a DVD, and I keep being like, yeah, I think so. But it, it was funny because when we first started this process, you know, when we were looking into distributors, Everybody was like, well, no one does DVD anymore. But it's people have been asking for DVDs. So I, I don't I don't know. Do you guys, if you like DVD, let us know. Because I feel like people don't think that people buy DVDs anymore. I, I mean, I don't know. Really or they think, I think that what's true is that DVDs are becoming um, really specialized. Like yeah. they're collector's items for people who... Um, you know, really enjoy collecting stuff. And I think that that's what I heard actually was interesting is that the DVDs now that are doing actually really well are like those Criterion Collection special edition, like specially packaged DVDs. Yeah. Things like that, collector's items. I could see that because I was thinking about getting someone. Actually, we, we got my mom, I think, some special DVDs for Christmas because it's a good, like, gift. I get, I get DVD, like, I have given, like, the entire season – of Firefly as a gift, or yeah. even like box sets of it, like that, like all of that stuff. Those are great gifts. I think the whole like general DVD market is basically gutted, yeah. but collectors stuff and box sets is doing pretty well. Yeah. Um, okay. New question. Um, I like that some person just told me I'm gonna buy the movie. Let's talk about something else. We have nothing else to talk about. We have no nothing else on our minds. Don't even ask me. Don't ask me anything except about that. I'm just kidding. You can ask anything you want. You guys can ask anything. 
you helped us to be on the top indie picks. That's why we're doing this. So you can ask us whatever you want. Um, yeah. Not whatever you want. Let's not be crazy. Um, 95% okay. of the questions that you ask will probably answer. Mm -hmm. okay. um, Houseboat Mom wants to know, what is Michelle Lawler doing now? I actually, Michelle Lawler, so I've been trying in the past week to get me, Vera, and Michelle Lawler, who, has, who is our director of photography, together to do a um, commentary that I want to release online. I'm going to release that one, and then I also want to release one of me doing a commentary where I'm really drunk, because I think it'll be really funny, because I feel like I will say things, I don't know, because I've seen this movie so many times that I feel like I have a lot of funny, maybe it'll be not funny, but I think it'll be worth listening to. Um, but Michelle Lawler is so busy that I can't even, I know she wrote an email to us today, Vera, but I haven't read it, but I mean, she, I can't, I can't tie her down because she's so busy doing whatever it is she does, which is a lot of stuff. Yeah, she's about to shoot a short, um, and, uh, which I think is also featuring an actor from The Killing. Uh, oh, yeah, 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 so she's about to do a short. And she's been working nonstop, and her films have been playing in festivals. Um, so she's been doing a lot of festival circuit stuff. Uh, so she's been actually super busy, yeah. Yeah, she's super busy. Yeah. Okay, so Jacob Berman, 25, I hope that's your age, I don't know, says, um, loved you since Dexter, Bria. When does the movie come out on Blu-ray, and what's next for you? Um, like I said, and it's funny, people are replying now on Twitter saying that, no one buys DVDs, but people buy, buy Blu-rays. I'm like behind in the times by saying DVDs. Apparently, no one actually buys DVDs. Um, so we don't know about the Blu-ray question, but it will hopefully be the same as the DVD question. I have no idea. It's up to this distribution company that we're crossing our fingers that all, all goes well, and we'll, we'll be able to announce very soon. Um, and what's next for me, I just got done shooting a movie um, called Smothered, and it's a horror movie. Um, starring Bria looks amazing in it. I know. Did you know they released photos online? So people can see that I look very interesting in the movie. Um, and we're, I wear a wig. I'm almost unrecognizable. I wear a wig, and I have giant prosthetic breasts. <laughs> Don't know another way to put it. Um, it stars Kane Hodder and R.A. Mihailov and Bill Mosley and... Um, uh, uh, some people I'm forgetting, Malcolm Denar, who from Christine, so all these like super horror villains who are in like Texas Chainsaw and Jason and I Know What You Did Last Summer and all that kind of stuff. So it's all these guys and um, they are um, kind of on the other end of their own um, um, hauntings, I would say. So it's a very fun movie and I just shot it and John Schneider directed it. John, most people know as Bo Duke or... Pa Kent, that's how I know him. Did you watch Supernatural, Vera? Yeah. I like Supernatural. He wasn't on Supernatural. He was on... Um... I mean, I'm sorry. That's not what I meant. Smallville. Smallville. And yes. I also watched Dukes of Hazard religiously. Did you? Are you old enough to watch Dukes of Hazard? Yeah. Well, I mean, there are probably reruns. No, but I'm old, old, Bria. Remember, I'm No, 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 no. Because I old. hung out with John a lot in South Louisiana. We were in a town called Denham Springs, um, and we would go to a restaurant, and women would come up to him, and it was women over the age of 50, for sure, were, like, his main... They would come up to him and just be like, I loved you on Dukes of Hazz. And, like, they just loved him. And, like, he was so nice and would take photos with them. I mean, yeah, like I, but even when I watched Dukes of Hazard, I wasn't crushed out on Bo or Luke. I know. Who was your crush on Dukes of Hazard? I didn't really have one. I mean, I just really loved Roscoe Pico Train and Boss Hog. I don't know. I was just really into the whole thing. I don't know why, but I didn't have a crush. I didn't have a crush. Right. I basically wanted, though, very badly to do the run, slide across the hood. Sure, totally. Yeah, like I really, and then yeah, I really wanted, and then just like climb into the car. I really wanted to do that. Did you see the 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 um the reboot? Did no. you watch? Because it? it had like Jessica Simpson and stuff in it, right? It was like kind of. Well, she was Daisy Dukes. Crazy. All right, no more questions. Let's see more questions. Um, Jack Marchetti um says, "What did you find? What did you find to be the hardest part of directing?" Um. I was talking about this today. We, Vera and I have a couple of interviews coming out in the next week or so. Um, but I was talking about this today with someone where I was like, I felt like when I watched, when I, 
I felt like here's what was going to happen. I was like, I'm going to be a director. That means I get to control everything. I like get to make all the choices. I get to be in charge. It's going to be awesome. But really, a director is about making like 50 other people super happy without being a bitch. And I had a lot of trouble with that because I am a little bit of a jerk. And I think I didn't expect that. So I kept being like, wow, I have to keep having to give in to all these other people's ideas when like, this is my idea. I want it to look like this. I want this to be what's happening. But when there's everyone from, you know, a sound designer to a, you know, anybody like it has like opinions about it. And then you're constantly like making concessions. It's a, it, I, I found that that was the hardest part for me. It was like dealing with I, basically, I'm a I'm I'm a lone wolf, and I wanted to. I thought I thought it was gonna be like a lone wolf kind of situation where it was like I'm making all these choices in the dark by myself, like with my headphones on, and like it's not like that at all. My choices were very public, and I had to defend them, you know. And I think that that ended up being a lot harder than I thought it was going to be. I like someone just asked me what's in the cup, Jack Daniels, and hold on, hold on, it's not Jack Daniels. <laughs> What is it? <laughs> um, Jameson, bitch, I'm Irish. <laughs> I, um, I'm having a hot toddy because I'm not feeling so great. And my mom always says, when you don't feel good, you should be drinking hot toddies. <laughs> Don Banker? Don that's Banker. A prescription for all illness? Yeah. Yeah, that's what I, because today I called her and I was like, my throat hurts. And she was like, oh, just drink a hot toddy. Um, uh, 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 Okay, some more questions. Someone corrected me with Smallville. Good job, sir. Oh, somebody said that guy was born in 25. I love all these people. You guys are so interesting. Alex Barr says, do you worry about being typecast as a genre girl, not to besmirch those kinds of films, but does it ever get creatively limiting? God, that is such a good question because I do worry about that. Um, the problem is I like genre movies. So, like, okay, so, for, so I get scripts, you know, a few scripts a month or whatever maybe that say then they're like we want you to come do this movie and like I'm way more likely to do the genre movie because I like genre movies better it's what I consume it's what Vera consumes I know and so when I read them I'm more forgiving maybe or even I'm just more interested in like doing a sci-fi or a horror movie because I know it's something that I would want to watch after and it's harder for me to look at um, like a drama a straightforward drama and be like oh I'm this is going to be good. And that's not to say, like, across the board that's the case, because obviously I go and do dramas. I love doing comedies. And this movie I just did, I would say, is more comedy than horror, even though it had a lot of horror people in it. Um, so I don't know. I don't worry about it, because I think I also think that people are super... I think this day and age, people are getting more and more forgiving about that stuff. I think we see people do... We used to say, like, this is a television actor, and this person does horror movies. And I think people do everything now. And maybe I'm naive, but that's that's my opinion about that. Um, they said we should have done a hood slide in BFF. We should have, Vera. God. We still we still could. I mean I'm I'm always down to do a hood slide. Anytime. Um okay, alright. It's good to know. You guys keep that keep that on the keep 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 knowing that. Um uh, Jacob Berman twenty five who is telling me that um, 25 is the date of his birth. Um, he wants to know if it's too late to support Kickstarter for a DVD. Vera, can you answer that? Yes, our Kickstarter campaign has, 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 has ended. Um, so we can't use that anymore. And, you know, that's really, 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 really sweet and really nice. Um, we are trying, I pro like, we're really trying so hard to make it happen. We're going to make it happen. We're going to make it happen one way or the other, um, you know, for, uh, wait, is, wait, let me, oh, oh, maybe I got confused. Is Jacob asking it because he's not a Kickstarter donor and you want a DVD if, regardless yeah. of, yeah, okay. That's what you're saying, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so, but I think that people can get a DVD eventually and. We'll try, we're doing our best. that has been crazy about this whole process, which I didn't think about, was that um, we don't get to set the prices of anything. So, like, when I logged onto iTunes, I was like, oh, my God, our movie's, like, $15. It's kind of a lot of money. And, I mean, I don't know if I'm supposed to be saying that, but um, I just feel like 
the, like, I mean, and hopefully the DVDs, I don't, I don't think we'll be able to control that as well. So I hope people don't mind spending that money. Do you know what I mean? I don't know if you had the same reaction when you saw it. When I mean, you can get it in standard definition, rent it for less. Obviously, we want people to buy it for more, but I just thought it was higher than I thought it would be for some reason. I don't know. I had friends who definitely were like, oh, it's money's a little bit tight. I mean, seriously, seriously, I literally had friends say that. Money's a little bit tight. In the, and I was like, well, there's a standard deaf version and a rental. So Right. Which is, I, by the way, I rented something in standard deaf the other day, and I realized that was a very poor choice. Why? Is it really different? Yeah, it does. It looks, it looks <laughs> crappy. I am so used to watching HD, I think, just because my TV's HD and stuff. I don't know. It just looked terrible. I watched... Um, the movie was great. I watched this movie called um, Break Up at a Wedding. It was an indie comedy. It's really good by um, Before the Door Did It, which is Zach Quinto's company. Mm -hmm. It was quite good. It was like a little um, handheld documentary, mockumentary kind of thing. Anyway. Um, okay, you guys have us for 15 more minutes, and then Vera has to go to her dance class. So if you have questions about Best Friends Forever, or me, or Vera, or my, my drinking problem, please go ahead and and, and send them on in. Um, Houseboat Mom wants us to talk about the music. So we have this amazing music supervisor, which on a movie of our size, it's very rare to be able to afford to have a music supervisor. But our producer, Stacey Story, introduced me to this girl who is in, who's in Austin, Texas. Her name's Laura Bouchery. I don't know how you say her last name. Do you know how to say her last name? I thought it was Bouchery. I only talked to her via email, so it's super weird. But she basically, I was like, I want bands, a lot of Texas bands, since we shot the movie in Texas. And so she would just send me these amazing bands and be like, I can talk these people into giving this, <laughs> this song for free. And that would made it, you know, that much better. And so we, um, we ended up with this amazing soundtrack, and hopefully something happens with it because our friends gave a lot of songs. We have great, great like, local like uh, L.A. bands like um, Chantal Claret and Lexington's and people like that, as well as great Austin bands. So it's like an, it is a really amazing soundtrack that I think is both sort of vintage -y retro, like has like a 60s feel to it, as well as like, um, you know, has like a Texas so sort of southern feel to it. I think it ended up being amazing. I'm super Yeah, happy. and there were great bands from other places, like, you know, like uh, there's an incredible band from Oakland named Hot Tub. They're yeah. just, they're like the female Beastie Boys. They're incredible live, and they were so great. They gave us um, a really key song. Another band, um, a, you know, a, a band that's three women in Portland called Lovers. Oh, yeah, that, and that sounds amazing. And that's during yeah. the scene where we're post-apocalyptic ourselves. Yeah, it was kind of incredible because there's all these bands, they're making amazing music, and, you know, I hope for them that they get to a point in which it's not a good business decision for them to give us their songs. Their songs? <laughs> I'm hoping, though, that the movie, like, people ask that question more and more, and they go and look up the bands, because they're all credited. You can find all the information about them and go buy their albums, because they're amazing, and they're the albums that actually are on my phone still, and I listen to those albums all the time. They're really super inspiring. Okay. Um, oh, my goodness. All right. Um, Library Dud, I like that name. Um, do you have any funny stories on set? Vera, do you have any? Did I have fun on set? I'm not sure. <laughs> funny stories. Every day was funny. <gasps> there was the day, Bria. Okay, so Bria and I, are you thinking about the pacer? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So the pacer, this damn car, would only run 25% of the time. If that. And so we lost so many days to shooting, and we had to, like, you know, Bria and Michelle especially had to basically constantly think on their feet about what to do because we're making a road trip film and the car doesn't work. Let me tell you, it's really complicated if you're making a road trip film and your car doesn't turn on or move. Um, <clears throat> and so there was this one, we just needed to get one shot of the car pulling away from a bathroom, crossing the camera. That was it. It was such a basic shot. And the car wouldn't turn on. No, it wasn't basic. So it was that 
we had to pass through, and then the camera was on a dolly, and it was supposed to right. dock in towards this thing. So we needed the car to wipe the shot in order to, you know, motivate the camera to dolly through, and so you could see, so we would close, um, do a close up on this radio. Yes, and yeah. then somehow Bria was able to turn the engine over somehow. <laughs> so, oh my God, we pull out. We're like, we can't believe it. We're screaming. We're like, oh, my God, it's on. It's, it's working. Oh, it's working. <laughs> it's working. It's working. You know? So we drive. And we, what? We just started, we were screaming. We were so delirious also. I know. But we, were, we started screaming out the window. I was like, just roll it. Roll it. And like, I was going around the block. Remember, because like, I got to go, and I went all the way on the block, and we couldn't slow down, because once the pacer hit, like, a certain, like, it was, like, the car in speed. Like, once it went below a certain level, once it, it would die, it, bus, it would die. So I just, like, kept driving it really fast, and then I just kept driving. I drove around the block, like, two times, and I was and like, then, and, and never, and, you know, like, making turns around a corner without being able to brake at all, and, and then we were in the car, and Bria's the director, and so we're screaming out the window. I'm cracking the window and screaming, we're coming about again. We're coming. And I'm screaming. I'm yeah. going around the whole block because I can't tell if they can hear us. And Bri and I are laughing so hard. I know. I mean, it like, was insane. About that and we come careening around the corner, like screeching. And like she like pulls in and pulls that through. We're like, we had no idea if they got the shot. And then we're back again, screaming out the window. And like I think um, the second or the third time around the block, you looked at me and you said, "Wait, we're wearing mics. <laughs> you don't have to scream out the window into like the Texas street for them to hear that we're gonna come around. We could just literally whisper it, yeah. and this, our sound mixer would have heard and been able to convey everything to the whole crew. That was an amazing day. That, that was amazing." I'm okay, sorry. all right, so we have a bunch of questions. We're going to have to, like, pull out through some of these. All right, I'll Tommy stay, Davis. I can stay for a little bit longer. Okay, Tommy Davis asks, um, has sci-fi totally done away with their Saturday night movies? I love those. Started following Bri on Twitter after watching Ice Road Terror. I wanted to bring that up because I love that you've seen Ice Road Terror. Um, <laughs> it was an amazing – actually, it was a really fun shoot. I got to go to Vancouver and play around and shoot, like, a, a fire a fire gun thing. I don't know. I'd like A, a flamethrower? A flamethrower. It wasn't really a flamethrower, though, let's be honest. It was more of like a, I don't know. I got to run away from an explosion in slow motion. I didn't run in slow motion, but they put it in slow motion. It was super fun. That was an amazing thing. I don't know if they film those anymore, but the girl, I just did a movie. I did just did this movie, Smothered, and the girl, one of the girls in it, it's a movie called Raging Cajun Redneck something. Alligator or something? Raging Cajun Redneck something. And um, I think she shot that recently. So I think that they're still doing those movies. And I hope they are because I feel like it's something that Sci-Fi Channel has figured out how to do well is to make those movies on the cheap with cool people. Um, I think I know Greg Grumberg did one right after I did one. And, I, I mean, they just have, like, kind of fun, silly monster movies. And I think that they really cornered the market on, like, B-movie. Although I hear, I hear Big Ass Spider is amazing. Big Ass – whatever. Mm -hmm. It's another – another movie. Um, Garrett Hipsen, Hipsman, Garrett Hipsman, um, said he's been holding out for the DVD, but he might break down and get the digital download. Garrett, I just want to let you know, you should do that. That's, let's, let's go ahead and get that done. <laughs> um, Stupid Kevin called, uh, this thing that I did on Dexter, the Dexter dip, and now people are asking me to do it, and I'm not going to do it, just so you know. Dex, do you know what they're talking about, Vera? My Dex, what Kevin called the Dexter dip, where I'm... My butt is in the air. Oh, but on the chair? Yeah, yeah. Totally. yeah. Kevin called that the Dexter dip at some point, and now people will quote that to me. Um, um, Jack Marchetti wants to know, was there any scene in the script you couldn't wait to see on the screen? Did it live up to your expectations when you wrote it? Um, what's so funny about the movie is it ended up looking a lot like what I, what I pictured in my head. I mean, I'm not sure about Vera. But, like, because um, I went through and drew storyboards. Because I write comic books, I drew storyboards that looked like comic books, basically. I was like, you know, this is this shot. This is this, and it looked very comic book-like. And it ended up looking a lot like what I drew it, which was super cool. Um, 
any scene that I couldn't, I'm trying to think of the scenes that I was really excited to do. It was mostly those like big landscape-y scenes where it's like us walking and there's huge landscape behind us because I really was like, we have to shoot this in West Texas. We have to shoot this like in Marfa, which is a little tiny town in West Texas. Because I was like, it's so beautiful. We can't not do it. It's amazing. Um, and and luckily enough, Vera and everybody agreed. They were like, yeah, let's do it. That's, that's what we need to do. And no one fought me on this crazy thing, which was taking an entire crew out to West Texas. <laughs> Super crazy when we think about it now, when I think about it now. Um, and it just looked so beautiful. I couldn't, when we got our first set of dailies, we were like screaming. We were screaming because it looked so amazingly beautiful and the skies looked as expansive as they do in real life, which was an amazing thing. Yeah. Um, uh, the Engages wants to know, Bria, an off-the-wall question that I just have to know the answer to, will there, be worth, will there be another season of Game Shop? I don't know. Um, because here's the thing, IGN is not, it was through IGN's start, that's who did that show, and now they got bought by somebody. And so I don't know what's going on with that show anymore. And um, the people to ask would, I mean, I guess I would ask IGN, but I don't, I don't even know. I, we were really hoping for a second season. And I thought it ended up being really great. And it was an easy show for them to shoot. It all took place in that one store. We shot the entire season in two weeks. And I would love to do it again. It was super fun. Amazing show. Mm. Um... Um, Jacob Berman, 25, says DVDs, um, oh, he's, he's talking about DVDs, and he wants, he likes to have the physical, and he wants to know, ho hopes they come out soon, and he wants to know if there's any chance of us doing conventions to promote them. Conventions? <clears throat> like, uh, like, like comic and, I don't know if he means comic or horror or everything. Um. <laughs> I don't know if they say anything. Answer that, Vera. That's you. It's all you. I'll just look for more questions. I, I mean, I think that if conventions were interested in us coming to, I mean, I, I think Bria and I are pretty down to do lots of things just to get the word out about the film. Um, <clears throat> totally. So. If somebody invited us, I'm, um, yeah. we're not doing Comic Con this year. We made that decision because I think San Diego Comic Con is very. I just think that the small things get lost in the big things. I don't think it's the same thing with New York Comic Con. I feel like that one's a lot more friendly. I like, um, I mean, there's a couple of other conventions that I really like a lot that I feel like are much more friendly to smaller projects. Um, and if we got invited to one of those, I would totally do something at like an, like um, at Emerald City or um, uh, at WonderCon or something like that. That would be super fun I would, um, if we, we got that invite. But as of right now, I mean, We've done a lot of festivals, and so I think we're, like, hoping at this point the promotion is getting done, you know. But, you know, if we got invited, I think we would probably make it out. Um, oh, Dave Fri Fri Friedel, Friedel wants to know if we stop and sang um, Bohemian Raps Rhapsody, I think, when we were doing the car thing. We didn't. We didn't even think about it. And for some reason, that song was never sang on the set, which it should have been because we were in... The Wayne's World car. Not the original. People said it was the original and it wasn't. But, I mean, we, I mean, I don't know if you saw the, the Dave Friedel see our Kickstarter video. Yeah, I think, we, I think he did. I think he did. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, I mean, I feel like we were so like this on the shoot that it never occurred to us to have a good time in the Wayne's World car. <laughs> um, um, okay. Sorry, I'm reading because we have like a few I want to get through before you have to go. Um, um, and you guys can send a few more if you want before Vera has to go to her. I have until eight. Okay. Okay. Cool. Um, Mo V wants to know: um, Do you feel that the post-apocalyptic film formula needs the violence on women and empty grocery store to feel truly post-apocalyptic? I think that's a good question. Huh. Like, like we are I, kind of tropes, and we did use them. And we also, someone was saying the other day, we used um, the uh, news footage trope, which is like, you know, we cut to a, this is what's happening in the rest of the world because we can't afford to actually show it <laughs> on a television set so you would know there was post-apocalyptic things happening. It's true. We did use those tropes. 
you know, and tropes come from somewhere. They really are, actually. Like, you know, I mean, when Bria and I started writing this story, we spent a lot of time talking about what it was like when 9-11 happened. And I was in New York, and um, Bria was in Austin, and we had really different experiences of, like, our city and people around us when 9-11 happened. And I'll tell you, like, I could... It's interesting because I could see the towers outside of my bedroom window. Um, so w when I was starting to comprehend what was happening, I ran to my bedroom window and the towers were burning. And um, it, it was before the first tower fell. I couldn't, I couldn't um, absorb it. And I ran and I turned on my television. And... Um, and the thing was is that, like, the, for a while, because the main, the main satellite, uh, and the main antenna, right, that handled all of the TV broadcasts for New York was on the towers. So there was a period of time when the, when the planes first hit the towers that there was no television. It was just static. And then they, they scrambled and scrambled and redirected to, like, an old antenna on the Empire State Building. And so by the time, like... I was panicking, 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 and finally a picture came through. And I swear to you, I want I just watched the news. Even though it was happening outside of my bedroom window, I couldn't absorb that. I couldn't handle that. My my brain, my heart, my body, I couldn't take it in. But I could watch it on a TV screen. I could have the news anchors tell me what was happening and show me footage of what was happening outside of my window. <coughs> So yeah, I do think that we use those tropes, and I do think that they're really, really, really important. Um, uh, and the violence against women thing, you know, Bri and I really talked about that a lot when we were writing the script. You know, I really feel like that was a conversation that we really had. Um, and unfortunately, for me at least personally, I stand by the idea that, you know, in the case of any kind of situation where you have society falling apart, that is actually going to be one of the most common you know, you know, um, Bri and I were talking a little bit about Egypt on this interview and, and how we're both watching it. And I just read this article that um, they said, did you read it, Bria, that they're reporting at least 100 women have been assaulted in Tahrir Square during the demonstrations? I did not see that. You know, I mean, that it's just, it's completely underreported, but there's just, um, it's this you know, that the hundred cases that are, that, that, that are known are probably a small fraction of what's actually happening, you know, and so it, it may be a trope, but I, unfortunately I think it's true. I think so too. I mean, and I think, I think that the reason that tropes are tropes is because they're true and because they, they carry weight for people. Yeah. And so I think that they're useful in a way of saying, like, this is, you know, they're useful in that, like, it conveys something immediately. Like, I don't have to play a long TV thing to show to show that something's happening in the rest of the world or whatever. And people will be able to watch that and go, oh, I get it. Like, I know. This is, this is that TV thing, you know. Um, good, question, good question. Yeah, it is a good question. Um, Stevie1D1R, sorry, um, R, um, asks... Are there certain scenes that you wanted to keep in, keep in, but didn't make it past the cutting room floor? Since we shot on film, there are not a lot of scenes because we had to keep a lot of scenes, but we did rewrite the whole ending. So the original ending was much more based around the friendship and was very calm and and um, uh, sort of a very like indie movie ending. I would say it was very like a mumblecore ending, but the ending we end up ended up reshooting and putting in there, um, uh, it's very different, and I won't tell you what it is, because you guys should go download the movie. Um, but if you haven't already, done, it's, it's just, you will know that it's a very different, it has a lot more um, tension, and is a little bit more violent. So, I mean, that is one thing that ended up being very different. We also had a whole scene that ended up on the cutting room floor of, um, uh, at some point a bomb, pretty quickly, a bomb explodes, and in the original movie, in the original cut, we actually hear it and get thrown off the road. And we're like, whoa, what happened? But what ended up happening was that people were like, well, they're really stupid if they didn't actually know. <laughs> that, was, that was a nuclear bomb because it threw them off the road. So we ended up making it so that it didn't really affect them. You can only just kind of see it in the distance. Sort of what we did. Um, um, Eric, Eric, my friend Eric 
Redden, I don't know how to say your last name, and I don't know if I've ever asked you, um, uh, wants to know, were there any moments where you regretted not filming digitally? Um, I would say the one moment that I will remember distinctly for the rest of my life was about 3 o'clock in the morning in Texas, um, and we were, and my producer comes up to me and says, hey, we're almost out of film. <laughs> <laughs> and we had expected to be almost out, but I had shot over the amount on one night. And um, and we just had a couple of big nights in a row. We were almost out of film. Luckily, we had someone flying in that night who was able to pick us up some film and fly the film up to us. But that was a moment where I was like, it was like a Friday night, so everywhere was going to be closed on Saturday. It was like, I, it was so crazy. But we ended up being able to get the film. But that was a super scary moment for me. And me being like, oh crap, film, you physically run out of like a film. Like you run out of film, you run out of it, as opposed to digital, where you could shoot for the rest of your life and maybe you'll run out of a little card, but then you put it on some digital drive somewhere and it's fine. Then didn't Bria, didn't you also have that moment when we realized that we had some focus issues? Oh my god. On some yeah. of the footage. You know, like so because we couldn't see playback right away and we didn't get dailies right away because we were in the middle of nowhere. We didn't know that all this great footage, there were some focus issues having to do with equipment malfunctioning that we weren't aware of until after the fact. Yeah, which was a super bummer. And um, always test your lenses, just letting you guys know. Test your lenses. And we did, but we still ended up having some weird focus, focus problems. Yeah, it was just weird, weird stuff. Um, okay. Um, Eric also wants to know, oh, no, wait. Oh, 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 Dave is telling me it's Raging Cajun Redneck Gators. That's the one, and there's a girl who's in um, my movie by the name of Amy, who's also in that movie, and so I know they're still making those sci-fi movies somewhere. I think they're all made in Louisiana now, though. Um, Eric also wants to know where um, they can see my storyboards, and will they be on the DVD Blu-ray? Blu That's a good idea. We could put some of them. The problem is, a lot of them, I had, so I had a binder, and then at some point I went down to a, um, a little tiny notebook that I could carry around in my pocket because the problem with directing and acting is that I didn't really, and being on an indie movie, so I didn't have a trailer, obviously. Um, so I put, the, <laughs> I put, the, um, <laughs> I put the, the, my shot list like in my pocket or I'd hand it to somebody. In my reshoots, I'd hand it to my, we hired um, an assistant for me who was also my stand -in, and she carried around a backpack and I would throw it in there. But otherwise it was just... Um, you know, I'd have to, like, put it down somewhere, and I, I would try to put the storyboards on that, and I don't even know where that thing is. It was like, I went through two notebooks, but I, I don't know where it is. I do have at least two or three handwritten notebooks of, like, notes and stuff that I made along the way that I might photograph and put on the DVD, which I think would be super cool. If people are interested, I never know what people are interested in that kind of thing, but it's good to know if people are asking, I guess. Um, okay. This this may be our last question. Um, uh, Moby wants to know, Harriet's omission about Los Angeles to Reba, God, I hope you guys have seen the movie, otherwise, spoiler alert, um, <laughs> was that more to do with Reba's parental situation, or did she not know how to handle it? So, if you've seen the movie, which hopefully you have if you're tuning in, um, at some point, my character finds out about um, that there, there, there's been a nuclear explosion, and Vera's character, Reba, doesn't know. And the question is, why did I not say anything? Vera, do you want to talk about that? We both wrote the movie together, so I feel like we both have opinions about why that happened. I mean, I think, you know, uh, well, she does try, actually. Harriet does literally try to tell Reba, but... You know, I guess one could argue that the effort <laughs> was maybe not, it was disproportionate to the magnitude of the event, like she didn't try that hard. Um, and I think, yeah, it had to do with the fact that how is she going to, how is she going to convey that information, you know? Um, you know, and, and I, I, I see Harriet as a character who's really holding tight to the idea of optimism because she has so little inside of her that it's a, and it's, you know, and I, I don't know for you all if you know, if you've ever felt this way or known people who feel this way where it actually is a lifeboat, you know, you, you, it is actually that important. And for her to acknowledge that, you know, 
there's some really, really bad shit happening and it affects them and it stops this path that she has decided for herself that is her lifeboat to get out of whatever place that she's in, for her to acknowledge that that's not going to happen is, you know, in some respects, like her world collapsing even more. Um, and, you know, well, that's what, I, that's my, that's the psychology behind it, you know, in my brain. Yeah, I think so. I think that, and I think also, you know, they've been fighting, things are not going well, and it's that weird thing where, like, things are suddenly going well for the first time, and then you're like, crap, like, do I ruin this whole great experience we're having, or do I not? And I know that seems so trivial, but for someone like Harriet, who holds on to these very specific ideals of what she wants her life to look like, I think it becomes, like, about these... these it becomes whether or not um, you ruin those things. You ruin, like, you think things are going well, so you hold on to that for dear life, because you have so little else to hold on to, because everything in your life is built around a lie, essentially. I have a question for you, Bria. Go. Do you feel like, you know, like, okay, let's say an apocalypse were actually to happen now, right? And we are who we are. So we're genre lovers who've watched every single apocalypse zombie, monster, end of the world, vampire, transformers, everything that could possibly happen, right? Uh -huh. And like, like, like the people who asked us questions, we're familiar with all the tropes, we're so like, you know, we're so savvy. Do you feel like, how, how do you think that you would react at this point? Like, would it feel like this huge momentous thing? Or is there a way in which we've become sort of numb to you know what I'm you know what I'm trying to say yeah. like we become like, we're we be like oh yeah of course duh like there's obviously an apocalypse happening outside my window I'm, I mean it may not be that casual right but sure I get what you're but like you know what I'm saying like uh, I I wonder a little bit about that because in some respects I think about that for the way that we wrote these characters and how we played them like they haven't quite absorbed. And I do wonder if I would have a similar reaction. I mean, I I would like to think I would be super surprised by an apocalypse. Like, I would be like, I would be super surprised, but I also feel like I'd be ready. Like, I have my bug out bag. I have a machete. I have everything I need. I feel like I would know to board up my windows, and I would do all these things. But I don't know. I would, I mean, I think I would still... I don't know. I think I would be still surprised. I would hope I would be still surprised and not just so jaded that it would be like, right, of course this is happening. I don't know. What would you do? There's a part of me that's... <coughs> I feel like it could go one of two opposite extreme ways. One where I'm like, aha, I knew it. And I like leap on it right away and go full throttle. Or I'm like, you know what? Is this a hoax? You know, is this just a manufactured, like, and I feel like either one is, is, you know, it's such a reaction to stuff that's tempered by all the shit that I watch, basically, yeah. you know? But do you think you, if you relied on some of the tropes of things you knew, that it could end up being very bad? Like, if you, for example, in our movie, obviously, we get in a car with a guy, or a truck with a guy who ends up being crazy. Like, would you be like, oh, I can't get any trucks with any people? Like, would you, like, assume that certain people would be bad guys in, like, a post-apocalyptic world? Okay, so I don't get into trucks with guys to be yeah. <laughs> That's That's a general rule. It's a life one. No, I would. You know, I would, like, <laughs> crawl right in there. I would just, whatever. I'd, I'd be like, no, no, don't do it. Um... That's a good question. Like, would I fall back on some, like, stereotypes or some fears that I have about how people react, would react based on who they are? Such a good question. I don't know. You know, I don't, I don't know. It's, I feel like we'd be a lot of like, do you remember this happened in this movie? Like we would reference movies. Yes. Yeah. I feel like, you know, that's the thing that's interesting. Like that's the weird thing where if, if an actual apocalypse was happening, 
I would turn to you and be like, oh, right? Like, and now we made a movie. So I was like, remember that part where we wrote? And that seems slightly irreverent. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to end this broadcast because that's the, what the button says. Um, but thank you guys for tuning in. Yeah, and thank you so much. Thank you even more for um, buying the movie, putting us on the top movies on iTunes. Like, we we made this movie for no money. Hopefully one day Vera and I will get paid 25 cents each for making this movie. But you have yet to see a dime for this movie, and every time you guys buy it, it's one step closer to us, like, you know, getting it out there to people and getting to do what we wanted to do, which was people to actually see them. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks so, so much, guys. So thank you. And if, you know, if we're on iTunes again, top iTunes something next week, top anything, maybe we'll do it again because I feel yeah. like this was super fun and we got to talk to people. And there's still a lot of questions. I'm sorry we didn't answer all of your questions, but we will hopefully do this some other time. Okay. Bye, everyone. Bye, Bye Bria. Bye.